Today for our Experts in Emotion interview, we'll be speaking with Dr. Steven Pinker on violence and emotion. Dr. Pinker is an experimental psychologist and one of the world's foremost writers on language, mind, and human nature. He's currently a Harvard College professor and John Stone Family Professor of Psychology as well at Harvard University. His research on visual cognition and the psychology of language has won prizes from the National Academy of Sciences, the Royal Institution of Great Britain, the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, and the American Psychological Association. Dr. Pinker has also received seven honorary doctorates, several teaching awards at MIT and Harvard, and numerous prizes for his books, The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, and The Blank Slate. He's chair of the usage panel of the American Heritage Dictionary and often writes for the New York Times, Time, and the New Republic. He's been named Humanist of the Year, Prospects Magazine's The World's Top 100 Public Intellectuals, Foreign Policy's 100 Global Thinkers, and Time Magazine's The 100 Most Influential People in the World Today. So I now turn to our Experts in Emotion interview together with Dr. Steven Pinker. So thanks for speaking with us today, Steve. It's great to have you here. My pleasure. What I'd like to do is just start out by asking you a little bit about what got you interested in the topic of violence and emotion, sort of where did it begin for you? Well, I'm, as a psychologist, I'm interested in human nature and what makes people tick. Mm -hmm. And it's a hard problem to avoid because one of the questions that people naturally ask about human nature is, are we naturally violent or are we naturally peaceful and cooperative? Now, I think the, the answer to, the, to, to that question is, both and neither, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not a question you can avoid if you're interested in big questions about what makes us what we are. And speaking of that, I'd love to ask you some questions about just what makes us what we are by asking you a bit about your work on this topic, looking at violence. So you've recently published a book, The Better Angels you know, of Our Nature, and in this you powerfully demonstrate a somewhat counterintuitive but remarkable decline in violence in human society over time. And I wonder if you could just provide us with a little bit more about this really fascinating but again somewhat surprising finding for many. Yes, it's uh, one of the reasons it's surprising is we get our sense of the world from the news. And the news is about stuff that happens. It's not mm -hmm. about stuff that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And since rates of violence haven't gone down to zero, there are always enough violent incidents to fill the evening news. There are the th things that blow up, people who get shot. Mm -hmm. And because of the availability heuristic, namely that we estimate risk according to how easily we can recall vivid examples, our sense of how dangerous the world is is out of whack with the actual statistics. So this is an argument that depends a lot on statistics. Uh, for example, rates of uh, death in tribal warfare among uh, hunter-gatherer and hunter-horticulturalist societies who live uh, without the rule of law from a state control have rates of death in warfare that are far higher than those even in our worst wars. So that's something about the transition from the kind of tribal living that characterized a lot of our evolutionary history to modern society brought rates of violence down. Another decline occurred since the Middle Ages, uh, the, where uh, homicide statistics suggest that a contemporary European has about 1 35th the chance of being murdered as his medieval ancestors. A third change was in institutionalized uh, barbaric violent practices like uh, torture executions, burning someone at the stake or disemboweling them uh, alive, uh, the use of capital punishment for or trivial crimes like poaching and counterfeiting and uh, robbing uh, a store, uh, the institution of slavery, the institution of debtor's prisons, throwing someone in jail because they couldn't pay back a, a debt. Those were all abolished in a span of about 50 years in the second half of the 18th century. Then, more recently, since the end of World War II, uh, big, powerful countries have stopped waging war against each other. Germany and France, uh, we know, aren't going to go to war, and Russia and Poland. Uh, and that's very unusual in human history, in which states and empires were almost constantly at each other's throats. Uh, more subtly, in the 20 years since the fall of the Soviet empire, it hasn't just been big, powerful, developed countries that have stopped waging war on each other. But more and more, the rest of the world has um, stopped fighting civil wars and, uh, and, and rebel conflicts. Rates of death across the world in all forms of war have seen a bumpy trajectory, but a downward trajectory. Then finally, the, the various rights revolutions, civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, children's rights, animal rights, have all whittled down 
various categories of violence that used to be with us for, uh, for millennia. Uh, domestic violence, bullying, child abuse, uh, lynching, pogroms, um, uh, animals in, in blood sports, gay bashing, criminalization of homosexuality. All of these are gifts of the various rights revolutions of the last 50 or 60 years. So those are the, those are the empirical phenomena that I set out in the book. So these are really interesting empirical phenomena you're documenting, and people may wonder, well, why is violence declining, and what role could emotion play in this phenomena? You know, are we becoming a more pro-social, you know, type of society, experiencing a greater prevalence or, you know, uh, uh, intensity of emotions like empathy and compassion? So does emotion play a role in this decline in human violence, you think? Uh, it absolutely does. Um, for one thing, many categories of violence are, are, are emotional in the sense that they are not just uh, a, a, a calculated predatory violence where we want something, someone's in our way, we get rid of them. I mean, that, that is a big category of violence. And that you could consider just purely cognitive or rational. But, um, but there are many other forms of violence, kind of what we think of as senseless violence, which are really driven by the passions. Two men fight over a parking space, and one of them pulls out a knife, and you've got a, a body in a pool of blood. Uh, a nation feels that it has suffered a historic injustice and conquers, uh, tries to conquer a few uh, rocky islands or, or patches of barren land that you can't grow anything on, but it's just a match, matter of national pride. Or you have uh, sadism, where uh, serial killers or sometimes entire societies bring out the kids to watch a prisoner uh, uh, clawed with iron hooks or broken on the wheel. None of these are particularly rational in the sense of getting what you want. So they were driven by emotions. Then on the other side, there are um, some kinds of violence reduction that are purely cognitive. We People figure out violence is a bad thing. Let's see if we could figure out some way of uh, reducing it. But some of them are also emotional. We feel greater empathy toward a larger uh, category of living things. So rather than just feeling bad about our, our kids and cute little baby animals and our best friends, uh, we care more about strangers. We, we find it less um, fun to see them disemboweled. Uh, we find it painful, in fact, to see them in pain. Uh, Self-control, I don't know whether you want to call that an emotion or uh, a uh, it certainly interacts with the emotions. It, it suppresses behavior that is often triggered by the emotions. And there is a good argument that uh, exercising our capacity for self-control is one of the ways that we reduce violence. Someone insults you, you may be mad as hell, you may want to pull out a, a knife, but you count to 10, think the better of it, walk away, and self-control triumphs over emotion. So it's really interesting, and I mean, this begs the question of how we can continue to foster these better angels and sort of work towards promoting, you know, ultimately a violence-free society in many ways. What recommendations would you have to continue pushing this trend towards decreasing violence and perhaps greater empathy and compassion? Uh, I think that uh, greater empathy and compassion are, are good things, although I don't think they are enough. Uh, because I, I kind of doubt that you could really get a person to empathize with all 7 billion people on Earth. I mean, no one has the emotional energy. You get compassion fatigue. And it, it better not depend on, on that. Uh, also, there are cases where empathy is not such a good thing. Um, when, when we talk about corruption in the developing world, what we're kind of talking about is empathy in domains where it shouldn't apply, like you give a job to your... Uh, knucklehead brother-in-law because you feel bad for him uh, or your or your best friend you pay your best friend out of a sense of gratitude we call that cronyism and nepotism it is driven by empathy as opposed to say giving a job to a perfect stranger how cold-hearted is that but of course it is what you do if you follow the rule of law which will ultimately make everyone less violent than if it's one uh, clan of blood relatives fighting for the perquisites of power against another, each one empathizing plenty within their own, own clan. So it's not to knock empathy, but it, it isn't enough. You also need rule of law. I think you need a, uh, a government that will uh, penalize aggression, 
that will not only make individuals think the better of uh, committing aggression, but it calms them down because if they know that their enemies are penalized by the government, they don't have to develop a belligerent, macho, badass stance to uh, credibly assert deterrence. So good institutions, rule of law, a democratic society with uh, civil liberties, but an effective police force and, and uh, judicial system. Uh, certainly, anything that expands empathy, such as cosmopolitan experiences, you travel, you read the words of others, you're made aware of what life is like in uh, different times and places and among people who are unlike yourself. Mm -hmm. Also, just the, the spread of, of reason, knowledge of history, knowledge of uh, what kind of violence reduction measures have worked in the past. The uh, setting aside of violence as a, a problem to be solved rather than as always a contest uh, that, that you have to win. And finally, uh, taking advantage of our sense of trade, exchange, fairness, the idea that you can do business with people. Uh, an evolutionary psychologist would call it reciprocal altruism. When you trade favors with people, you're bound to them. Uh, they're more valuable to you alive than dead. You have ways of getting what you want other than through violence, namely by exchanging it for something that they want. Mm -hmm. So the cultivation of networks of reciprocity, uh, I think, has been another historical development that has reduced rates of violence. So I think these are really all important suggestions for thinking about how we can continue to foster a society where we see violence on the decline. And so I wonder, although empathy may not play, you know, the major role here, when we think about what role can you know, the study and understanding of emotion play as we look forward into the future, where do you see the most important next steps here? Well, certainly expanding uh, some of the things that have worked in uh, our society to other societies that are um, you know, have some catching up to do, particularly when it comes to the rights of women and gay people and uh, children. Um, so the, the idea that you don't throw gay people in jail, let alone execute them, uh, we, kind of, that, we kind of won that battle. That's not, no longer a live issue here. But it is a live issue in a, lot of, a large part of the world. The idea that uh, you don't try to settle scores of national humiliation, that uh, our country, our, our race, our religion has been humbled in the past. We have to get our revenge kind of get, getting people away from that tribal group against group mindset and toward a more individual uh, human rights mindset. Namely, what really counts are men, women, and children and their happiness. Groups are a kind of abstraction. To concentrate, and this relates back to your, your, your emphasis on empathy, to think of the individual, the actual thing that feels pleasure and pain, as opposed to the abstraction of the group, is one of the, the big... Um, developments that we've enjoyed in the West and that the, uh, the rest of the world could profit from uh, in the long term. So when we think then looking ahead with some of the suggestions that you offered, and especially the students who may be the next generation of conducting these kinds of studies or investigating these areas of inquiry, what advice would you give to future students who are thinking about embarking on the study of emotion as it relates to violence or just trying to understand violence more generally? Certainly to uh, appreciate uh, both the dark side and the bright side of human nature. I think a lot of psychology has tried to paint a uh, uh, kind of Sunday school p picture of human beings as naturally peaceable and cooperative. And while I, uh, I, I wrote a book about how we do have that side, we wouldn't need that side if we also didn't have a lot of really nasty, ugly motives. And I don't think psychologists should avert their gaze from the dark side of human nature. We can only, we can only hope to control it if we understand it. The other is to take a, a, an evidence-based approach to violence. It, it's often a topic of moralization. We all deplore violence. But how much do we understand about what, in fact, actually increases or decreases it? There, I came across a lot of you know, cockamamie ideas that are widely held, but for which there's no evidence, and some things that are not so obvious that turn out to be big reducers of violence. Mm. So we should have an open-minded, empirical, evidence-based mindset to understanding violence. Well, thank you so much for joining us again today, Steve. It's a pleasure to speak with you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, June. And this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Steven Pinker from Harvard University. Thank you. Everybody.